Listen. When They See Us is a work of art. I know Chernobyl won and I'm, I'm happy for it, but Ava DuVernay had one of the best miniseries of all time. It's only four episodes, each one ends on a mic drop, and it's based on a real story that absolutely everyone should know. Let me explain. Entertainment serves all kinds of different purposes. I love horror, I love romance, I love action. But to be able to uh, create something uh, with my collaborators that is actually gonna move people to action, move people to evaluate what they think and how they behave in the world was our goal. So the series is produced by Robert De Niro and Oprah Winfrey. It was the highest viewed on Netflix upon its release in over 190 countries, which as we've quoted Ava in the past, theaters may not be replaceable, but when you're showing movies about places, that don't even have theaters in the places that they're about, you realize that the reach streaming has is crucial. And so each episode sets out to break down the justice system and how easily it can be manipulated. The story revolves around five boys, Kevin Antron, Yusuf, Raymond, and Corey, who were wrongfully convicted of an incident that happened in Central Park on April 19th, 1989, mainly because this lady Linda didn't listen. You said on your report here they were wilding. What's that mean? Y'all know how it goes. If you don't know what something means, assume the worst. Out wilding with Tron? Even Jamal was like, Get off my block, lady. Thing is, when you really pay attention to how these cops were hyping up this incident, they just keep repeating how late it was. At 9.30, they're terrorizing folks here. At 10, one of them's raping the female jogger here. What happened in the half hour in between? What did these animals do? And like, to pretend that 10 p.m. is super late, when back in the day, Johnny Carson himself didn't go on to 11, yeah, it's just optics. It's like calling a 29-year-old Olympian a boy while Trayvon was a man at 16. Is there enough time for all this to even happen? Well, it happened, so obviously there was. They now have this room full of kids who they did keep up really late, and then when they heard that a brutal rape had happened in the park, they then created the story they wanted. This lady literally commands that they raid the projects, they manipulate statistics for their advantage, interrogate them for over 40 hours, and use emotion to lay blame on whoever they can corral. Because when you have that much power, you're practically in charge of deeming what's right and what's wrong, and you skew evidence to fit your story. It's some Targaryen level of delusion. When the police want what they want, they will do anything. No detective of mine would ever say anything like that. The words are their words. We don't put words in people's mouths. Oh, where? Y'all just alter DNA then? Their DNA isn't there. It's not anywhere. So there must have been another attacker. These cops start lying about things these kids weren't a part of, which eh, that's something that's always blown my mind. Using that tactic of lying in order to get the truth, uh, coming from law enforcement. I know what I was taught. I know what I was asked to do, and I did it. Hi, buddy. I'm your friendly neighborhood police officer. Would you like a glass of water? Yeah, yeah, actually. That's Too bad. They're abusing minors and interrogating them for hours without their parents, forcing them to sign away their Miranda rights. It was less about building a timeline to see who did it, but filling in the blanks for the story they had already created. And then they blackmail the parents. That's a good job. Yeah, yeah it is. The supervisor know about your past, Bobby? And if the parents weren't in the picture? The mother left voluntarily. It suddenly feels like Christmas. A reminder that all four coerced confessions are out on YouTube and you can watch the entirety of them. It has the interrogators filling in the gaps and all the blanks for them after all of the contradictions, after the 40 hours of keeping them up. And it would be Vlad who has all these tapes. This is why I highly recommend this video right here. I believe everyone should watch this about pleading the fifth. Not because you're hiding something, but because you're not going to be giving fragmented pieces that can be used against you. And this is coming from a white criminal defense lawyer from Harvard. Because if a cop can take 10 days to get their story straight, then you're allowed legal counsel. If not, then you'll be accused of committing a crime you know nothing about and meet your accomplices for the first time in a jail cell. I got a lot on you, man. I lied on you, too. Episode 2 breaks down the court system, bail, and the media. And bail is stupid crazy. Literally, if you have enough money, you can get away with crime. But if you're poor, 
yeah, you're screwed. This whole idea that we really have a debtor's prison mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. You can you can pay to get out or you can be poor and stay in. And that's really who these criminals are, people mm -hmm. who just couldn't pay. To think big corporate bails out all the time. You post one link for a bail fund for protesters and all of a sudden you're an anarchist now. Not to mention, they play more games in court than the NBA. Two, maybe three. We just have to find the right combination of defendants that requires the least amount of editing of the tapes. And when that fails? If they were present, if they did nothing to stop her agony, then they are guilty. Netflix has a whole series called Trial by Media that I, I highly recommend. It talks about how the news and public perception clearly affect the case. Like some people still hear this story and think they were guilty. I saw a stupidest comment on Facebook, which I, I know, that's on me. But imagine defending the Duke lacrosse team and demanding they rearrest these five men. Because this moron didn't know they caught the real dude in O2. Hell, this person thought the Pepsi can was Netflix marketing and thought they had something on them. Like, don't y'all know they have a deal with New Coke? Oh, sorry. To some people, it isn't even about evidence. To them, it's unfathomable for the story to be any other way than what they've already concocted in their mind because of what they saw on TV, what they hear on the news, when your interactions are limited with a certain demographic, or you're a cop who only deals with the negative. Then that image has been painted. And worse, they breed. Stop acting like a black. Act like a normal person. And then we won't judge you by your color. I've said on occasion, even about myself, if I were starting off today, I would love to be a well-educated black because I really believe they do have an actual advantage today. You better believe that I hate the people that took this girl and raped her brutally. You better believe it. This man took out an $85,000 ad wishing the death penalties on these boys. And even after they were proven innocent, this man wrote an op-ed and said, nah. Hopefully George is looking down right now and saying, there's a great thing that's happening for our country. There's a great day for him. It's a great day for everybody. Boy can't even tell when something's been edited like a much dank video. Ain't this Mr. Fake News? But you know what? Screw the Daily News too. They're the ones who ran the ads and then have the audacity to years later write an article after the Netflix series is out trying to call out Trump to take responsibility. Like... Didn't y'all take the money? This was all before their trial. You know, it was wow. two weeks after um, the, the news broke. And so this, this, this film asked you to think about the news. You know, at that time, 89% of the, of the headlines and the articles written about this case didn't use the word alleged. Episode two begins with the media manipulating the story just so everyone can revel in fear. And you know how they profit off misery all the way up to this day. They reworked their spam to be information, which if it's not behind a paywall, they'll hit you with 80 ads. Those same woke media outlets that claim to be on your side will be the first to turn on you. Hell, it was the New York Times who pegged the moniker of the Central Park Five, stripping them of their individuality so it was easier for the public to condemn them. And the title was was a big part of it. It's the first time you meet the movie is when it walks up to you and says, hi, my name is. Kevin, right? Who are you? Since I Episode 3 flashes forward to those who've been released. How'd you hold on to your sanity, Antron? By threat. Even to this day. Mm. I'm damaged. I need help. I know it, but um, I just try to keep myself busy. Um, they just, the system broke a lot of things in me that can't be fixed. For the four, their lives are altered. The locals turn the other way. Their love lives are ruined. And when it comes to looking for work... Now, once you've been inside, man, they got you. And they keep you. And then there's the impact to their families. I told them, you know, uh, too much trouble in the corner. Um, go to the park. I sent them to the park that night. So I feel guilt too. Michael K. Williams portrays Antron's father. And out of all the roles that I've seen this man in, where he always gets typecast as a tough guy because of his scar, Ava focuses on it not as an attribute for evil, but of a father's story who survived but still got to grow up with a reminder on his face while his son didn't get to grow up at all. I'm a victim of Wilden. These scars on my face, I got jumped. I got jumped by a pack of, of other young boys, you know, and I almost lost my life. I know what Wilden looks like and I know what it feels like. 
I know that trauma. Ava's 13th, which is available on YouTube for free, right? Right here, covers this vicious cycle even deeper on how prisons profit by creating legal slaves. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. Pretty much, jail is hiring, but they make all the money. It's like a sweatshop of Americans that a bunch of corporations and companies profit from. Like the Karens would say, Google it all the way down to the Idaho potatoes through plea bargains to criminalization of immigration. And now they're even going as far as GPS tracking because if the prisons are getting too full, then they're trying to figure out a way to move the prisons outside. The difference now is somebody can hold up one of these, get what's going on, they can put it on YouTube, and the whole world has to deal with it. That's what's new. It's not the protest, it's not the brutality, it's the fact that we can force a conversation about it. Speaking of Central Park 2020, there's now an Amy Cooper law in the works that's meant to counteract false accusations from people who feel they're wrapped in some authority that makes them superior to others, even weaponizing their differences. It's the blessing of slavery that it actually built up the framework for the world that white people live in. In. Yeah. If the phrase is the trip up, let's get over the phrase and let's get down to the heart. Sure. Let's get down to what then do you want to call it? And I think maybe a great thing for me is to call it white blessing. It's crazy to think how deep the legacy of Central Park goes, especially at its roots with Seneca Village, a settlement run by minorities that was destroyed because the rich folk wanted a park. That's only the tip of what's being uncovered. Meanwhile, the toll weighs on those who can't make enough to survive because of the system, are rejected by their families, and eventually end up rejecting themselves. What did I learn about the justice system is that it's the wrong name for it. Corey's episode is deserving of way more than an Emmy. Remember, this is the guy who wasn't even supposed to be there, but went to support his friend. You 16? Corey Wise, at the moment that he stepped foot off of that street in Harlem, never came back for another 13 and a half years. There was no bail, he never got bailed out, he never saw the light of day again. He went directly into Rikers at 16 years old, okay? So he had a different experience. When I first sat with him, he said, Ava, you could tell my story, but you need to know, right now I feel that it's four plus one because at least they were together and I was alone. Because his parent wasn't there, because he was 16, because they knew of his hearing problem, they made him sign things he couldn't read and then gave him the maximum. They had coordinated beatings at each facility that he was shipped to. He ends up in solitary confinement because an entire group was looking to kill him. He risked losing his mind instead of losing his life and was labeled a monster when all he wanted to do that night was be with his girl. I want to let you know that we don't have stars here. While in solitude, he wrestles with his mind and there's even a flashback of his sister who gets kicked out of her house because the mom saw her as a disease. So, at least I'm a real woman. And years later, into his sentence, he's notified that she died. And Ava directs it so he sees her one last time while he's mourning. But his final vision of her doesn't look like the person he last saw, but the person she wanted to become. Ma'am, you've made a masterpiece. It's crazy to think that without Corey in jail, he would have never interacted with the guy who actually did it. Yet it still wasn't until years later when that guy finally admits to it because he had found religion, that he was finally seeking redemption. And even after confessing, after connecting his DNA to the only sock they ever had, to a confession that actually makes sense because, you know, it wasn't the five, they still go. And that guy that confessed, he's the sixth guy. Okay, we missed the guy. Okay? The fuck? The delusion. Linda finds time in her busy schedule of, you get this, coming up with fake ideas for her crime books, which of course she would have a lot of them, to meet up with Nancy, the assistant DA from back in the day, who calls her out on the Cartman lies she's living. While you were writing crime novels, Kevin, Antron, Yusuf, Raymond, and Corey were serving time for crimes they didn't commit. And I'll be damned if I'm gonna lose a wink of sleep over it. I mean, with all those days off, for sure. But here's the sick part. You didn't just put them in jail. You changed the way they're supposed to live their lives. You told them they have to check a box every time they applied for a job they'd get denied at. 
stripped them of their rights, including to vote. You told them they were worthless. You told them there was a crime that was committed and then forced them into believing they did it and brought up the death penalty. And y'all are telling me there's no legal repercussions for getting that wrong? It's the police department investigating itself. But I think that it would be a tragedy if this story and the telling of it um, came down to one woman being punished for what she did because it's not about her. In 2002, they were finally exonerated and a settlement was meant to be given to them. That didn't happen until 2014. Well, the city's all settled along, the lawsuit, but they've never apologized. They've never no apologized. one has ever apologized yes. to the men or their families for yeah. Yeah. not what happened, but what was done. So let me get this straight. Y'all already wasted a decade plus of these gentlemen's lives. And then you deferred longer than a college student. I found out that the reason they dragged it out was because the city knew it would have to pay them. So they just delayed going to court. You are trash. Your whole department is trash. There literally had to be a new mayor in order for this to get settled. And I'm telling you right now, $41 million split five ways. If that was my kid, I know it's easy to say it, but if that was my kid, hell no. People forgot that we had to split it five ways. We had to pay attorney fees, Yeah. right? And and so now when you came in, they go, oh, you got $40 million. Yeah. Me? By myself? Yeah. Right? And yeah. so it made it worse in some instances. At this point, if, if you don't see the importance of these GoFundMes and how much technology has really helped, I'm let me explain, but I, I, I can't help you. They took diamonds and threw it in the dirt. And we were still diamonds. And when they picked us up, we were still diamonds, still unbreakable, still strong. Mm -hmm. And I think that for young people, for the future generations that are going to absolutely change this system, that's what gives me hope. Ava then wraps this story up beautifully, closing out the credits with the young black actors who played them with a superimposed summary of where they went, but letting the actors' names take a backseat for us to take a glance at the real men who went through this men who left New York as soon as they could, others who remembered their hometown and brought a peace with them, others who stayed busy after, and rightfully so, others who finally got moments that were stripped from them, all who are making sure this never happens again. This is the story of Kevin Richardson, Antron McRae, Yusuf Salam, Raymond Santana, and Corey Wise. And we see them. Oh, but uh, James 78141017, he said he's never gone through it. So, I mean, like, if he hasn't gone through it, then it probably doesn't exist.